In my experience of life, for me, Lord, perception is death, at least death of the yogi. The man may live, <laughs> the yogi is dead because he's lost his perception. He's lost his sensitivity, not just bending and twisting. You are beginning to feel the union in the existence. If this has to happen, body has to be sensitive and it has to have a minimum level of inertia. Now, if you eat food which in some way has deteriorated, it may not be rotten, <laughs> nor is it going to kill you, you can eat it <laughs> It is just that it will lower your perception. Well, I am not a scientist either and I don't wish to be one. I don't have either books to read, nor am I researching <laughs> anything, nor am I looking through a microscope, nor do I have a lab in my backyard. I just pay attention to this human mechanism, which is me. I kept it well, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of work to keep this well. Doesn't just come, so I keep it in a certain way. And at anything that happens in nature, I observe what's happening with me, and I'm speaking that, I'm also observing the life around me for confirmation. Every insect, worm, bird, animal, tree is saying the same thing. Well, if you are going to discover this after many years and a few billion dollars of research, it's up to you. Well, I want to tell you, till recently, these so-called scientists, the real science is different. A scientist who's looked at something with profoundness will not speak this way. These are uh, probably internet scientists, <laughs> you know. They know every science, not just one, everything they know because they are on the internet. Well, people are eating food that was cooked a week ago, ten days ago, three months ago, they're keeping it in their refrigerators and eating. After eating it, they don't know what's the difference to such people, what can you say <laughs> But for sure, they cannot have the sensitivity that I'm talking about. And I'm sure they're sleeping eight to ten hours a day. That is death for me <laughs> Ten hours of sleep, nearly forty percent death, isn't it, <laughs> in twenty-four hours. So, if you wish to live like that, you can eat whatever you want. What is the problem? You can eat anything you want. So such people were saying, I'm saying something so simple. They were advocating that alcohol, tobacco, red meat are the best things for your life, till recently. Now suddenly they've all become activists against that. Because somewhere somebody said after a billion dollar research, We've been saying it forever. What is a recent discovery for you has been an eternal wisdom for us. It is said that experience is the eternal wisdom. Said guru has spent a chunk of his life paying attention to human nature, the mechanism, how this human body runs in the spiritual aspect of our lives. This video is a compilation of the words of eternal and pure wisdom from Sadguru that can transform your life and change the way you deal with your life. Let's hear Sadguru and take benefit from his wisdom. Many times uh, in my daily life, uh, fear stops me from doing uh, small things and bigger things. Fear. Uh, from failure, feel from 
maybe from rejection sometimes. <coughs> uh, how to overcome this fear? You cannot overcome something which does not exist. Right now, are you in fear? Right now, that I may say something damaging. <laughs> Is it the fear? <laughs> Every moment of your life you're in fear? No. So, when you're not in fear, just stay like that. Because to create fear, you have to use excessive imagination. Fear is happening because of excessive imagination, things that have not happened, you're creating. What may happen in your mind happens in thousand different formats and most probably it never happens. The things that you feared, take hundred things that you have feared, probably ninety-nine of them never happened, isn't it? Yes. To not be in fear, you don't have to do anything. So your fear, your fear is always about that which does not exist. You cannot fight or you cannot overcome that which does not exist. We can overcome something that exists. You cannot overcome that which does not exist. You just have to give up that effort. Enjoy the fear. After all, it's your making. You like horror movies. Yes, uh, I mean you're saying no, but you, you're producing them. It's just they're not making money, that's all. Start using your mind differently. It's just gotten into your pattern just gotten into a pattern of just creating horror movies all the time. Fear means you're producing horror movies in your mind. Nobody else is willing to watch. Tch, that's bad for the producer. But you're producing them. So, you produce something else. Produce a comedy, a love story, suspense thriller. Try and see today, just sit down, produce a love story, a suspense thriller, a comedy, five, five minutes mo movies you make in your mind, really. You have watched enough horror movies, they're boring. Create something else. <laughs> Even it's not that if you produce these movies, those things will happen in your life. Still they may not happen, at least you enjoy the movie. <laughs> In reality, it may not happen, so what? At least you enjoy what's happening in your mind, if you cannot enjoy what's happening in the world, isn't it? That much privilege every human being deserves, isn't it so? Even if the world is not kind to him, at least his own mind should be kind to him, should produce some nice movies <laughs> uh, I have been uh, seeing your videos in YouTube, this is the first time that I'm seeing you live. So, I have a basic question which will help everyone here. Everyone talks about, you know, knowing ourselves and the first step is going inside and then the way to go inside is meditation. And when I try uh, Please, I don't… <laughs> I never said such things. I don't know which everyone said those things. Okay, so then how do we go inside? <laughs> That's the question. Inside what? You're already inside the hall. Inside what? Inside ourselves. Oh. <laughs> okay, if that is the truth of the first step of knowing answers for all the questions, if going inside is the answer, then how do we do that? First of all, you must understand what is inside, okay, and what is outside. If you do not understand what is inside and outside, then you will go to all the wrong places. Now, what is inside? Your body accumulated over a period of time, yes or no? Hello? Ma? What you accumulate can be yours, cannot be you. Is that much clear? Whatever it may be. What you accumulate can be yours, cannot be you. So this body is an accumulation 
what you call as my mind, the whole content of the mind is accumulated, depending upon what you're exposed to in your life. So your body is a heap of food, small or big, your mind is a heap of impressions, again small or big. Between these two heaps, where the hell are you? Different people employ different methods around them, looking at the people around them, what was best suitable for the people around them accordingly, they would have worked most probably. If they're genuine, they would have worked with the people around them, not with concepts from somewhere. What… looking at an individual person, you will do something, what works for that person. What you do with this person may not work for another person, you'll have to do something else with that person. But you're talking about a generic inward-outward. So first determine what is inward-outward. Everything is outward right now. So inside, outside, leave these words because when it comes to language, there is only that much leeway. So within that, maybe different people are trying to use it in different ways. We don't know in what context they used. You put everybody into one bundle and say, all of you said this, I don't know who these all people are. The world is outside, body is also external material, Every, all the material in the mind also is external. So what is this inward you're talking about? Then you will immediately say, atma, paramatma, soul, this one. Now you're going into belief system. You don't know. You know you have a body, yes? Hello? You know you have a body. You believe you have a mind. <laughs> but to some extent you know. But rest is belief. Yes or no? Yes. I am not questioning whether it's true or false, let's not go there at all. But it's belief, it's not yet in your experience. If you talk about something which is not yet in your experience, to put it bluntly, you're just a bloody liar. That's what it means. But because lies are holy, lies are written in scriptures, lies are repeated by all kinds of people who are dressed in different ways which are supposed to be holy though ridiculous. Because of this, you're not supposed to question these words. So, let's not talk about something that is not in your experience. Right now your body is in your experience to some extent, your mind is in your experience to some extent, rest you don't know. But we can infer, if I have to ca ca accumulate this much body, if I have to accumulate this much mind, something more fundamental must be there, yes? Something more fundamental must be there. We don't know what the hell it is, for now we will call it you. How you will go into yourself, I'm asking. You can go into this hall, you can go out of this hall. How will you go into yourself, I'm asking. Saying, let's leave this, this is not the way. You do this way. What is not you? All those things, you keep it aside. Anywhere you go, first thing is people say, Sadhguru, what about the soul? You ask them, which soul, right or left? Before today, if you… before you go to bed, everything that's not you, keep it aside. They may be precious to you. You think about it, your house, is it you? Oh, my house <laughs> All right, you have lots of passion about it, but all right, keep it aside. Your husband, is it you? No, that's easy, he's not me. <laughs> My children, are, is the… are they me? Oh, little difficulty, but no, <laughs> they're not me. They're beginning to tell you if they're twelve, they already told you <laughs> So the clothes that you wear, is that you? No. The body that you wear, is that you? No. All these thoughts and emotion, is this you? No. Everything that's not you, keep it in one heap. Not physically, just do this mentally. Keep everything aside. Let me see, every day you practice this, one day when you successfully keep everything aside that you are not, what you are will be there. Let's pay a little more attention. You are a worthwhile life which deserves some attention, isn't it? Don't seek other people's attention. 
your own attention. Doesn't this life deserve attention? Pay attention to this, enough attention, everything will be clear. Everything about you, you're asking me, if I tell you what you have, you have some more words. Some more words you have, that will not get you anywhere near the truth. One more word or ten more words doesn't get you any closer to reality, just you'll have more things to say to somebody else. This kind of hearsay is spreading in the world. We have too many ideas about things that we have not seen, it's a big problem. Shankaran Pillai went to Britannia <laughs> Can I? Shankaran Pillai went to Britannia Industries to find a job, to find a job. So they were looking for a really smart, forcing sales manager. So they asked him one question, which is further, Mumbai or Moon? Shankar Pillai thought. He said, Mumbai. He said, what? Mumbai is further than the moon? He said, yes. How? Well, I can see the moon, I can't see Mumbai <laughs> So what I'm saying is, if you go by your present perception, you'll get all the wrong conclusions. So don't be in a rush to make conclusions. So, we have arrived at many things, we know, in every culture they know what is the nature of God, where He resides, how the ambience is there and the works, you know. Everybody knows where God is, who his wife is, how many children he has, when is his birthday, his address. In every bhajan people are singing his address, where he is and how to get him, but they don't know a damn thing about themselves. This kind of uh, what to say, a very knowledgeable ignorance is dangerous, <laughs> you know. If you do not know, it's not a problem. If I see I do not know, the possibility of knowing is always there, isn't it? If I do not know and I think I know, then I've destroyed all possibilities. You… everybody knows the geography of the heaven, isn't it, don't you? But you don't know a damn thing about yourself. It's time, it's time we paid attention because everything you know, you know it only the way it's projected in the firmament of your mind. You don't know anything any other way, yes or no? Right now everything is seen depending upon how you're identified with something. So what you need to fix is, you are seeing everything in a mirror of your mind and the mirror is wonky, first fix it. First thing is to make it stable, flat, proper plane mirror so that you see everything the way it is. Does a plane mirror show you everything the way it is? Everything reverse, you know. Then you will have to flip it, that'll take much more skill. Most people can't flip a dosa <laughs> Now to flip the whole universe, the whole life that is reflecting in your mind, to flip it over without shattering it into pieces will take much more. But the first thing is, to level out the mirror so that it shows you everything the way it is, not some other way. Every identity has distorted the mirror of your mind and it shows you things in completely different way than the way it is. First thing is stop talking about things that you do not know. No soul, no atman, no paramatman, no god, no divine, no heaven. Talk about something that you know and then the longing to take the next step will become strong. Otherwise, when you know the geography of the heaven, what is the need to pay attention to anything? If your mind or your intelligence does not get entangled with any identity, including your body, including your own thought process, including your own emotion, spiritual process is very natural. If your intelligence is not entangled with anything, it's very natural for your intelligence to inquire and open up different dimensions of life. You identify yourself with something in search of security, in search of safety, in, in search of self-preservation. Otherwise, it's not doing anything else, please see. It gives you some sense of false sense of belonging, which you will anyway shed someday. The moment you're identified with something that you're not, your intelligence is freaked. It will go in cycles around us. 
your mind is functioning with a certain identity. Once there is an identity, it is prejudiced. But whatever you are identified with, your intelligence functions only around that, please see. Yes? If you identify yourself with your religion, your nationality, your family, it works only around that. It's a certain type of prejudice, isn't it? A prejudiced mind cannot see. A prejudiced mind cannot reveal the reality of life, that's all it is. When I say prejudice, it's on many different levels. No, no, I'm very broad-minded, I am not prejudiced. Uh, well, you have a broad prejudice. <laughs> Mind is a very prejudiced thing. It all depends what you're identified with, you know. Whatever you're identified with, your mind rotates around that. Right now you're identified with many things that you're not, many. For example, <clears throat> if I say, I'm speaking as I'm speaking, suddenly if I pick up this glass and say, this is my glass, you think, okay, Sadhguru has a problem. But it's all right, everybody says he's wise, let's listen. After some time I say, this is me, then you say, let's go, enough <laughs> This is too much. Please see, this is what has happened to you. For example, there are many ways to look at this. For example, food appears on your plate. You say, this is my food, you eat it and then you say, this is me. Isn't it so? What you call as my body is just a heap of food or no? Yes, it's a food that you've eaten, isn't it? Did you accumulate your mind over a period of time? Yes. But both these things right now you call as myself, isn't it? And it doesn't stop there. It just extends into many things. Your home, your car, your things, your money, your children, your husband, your wife, a million other things, your religion, your ideas, your ideologies, everything. You are identified with too many things which you are not. Once you are like this, your intelligence is freaked. It's a wonky intelligence, it's lost its penetration. It simply repeats old nonsense. Tenali Rama was a jester in Krishna Devaraya's <clears throat> court, similar things happened also with Akbar and Birbu, but we will stick to the South Indian story. It so happened when Krishna Devaraya was young, because of some political reasons, his mother had to leave a few month old Krishna Devaraya with another woman for care and go somewhere. For more than eighteen months, the child was separated from the mother, but he was under the care of another woman who also had a child who was a few months older than Krishna Devaraya. So this woman nursed Krishna Devaraya as her own child, but later on his mother came back, took him and then he became a great emperor. So this boy who was that woman's son, Krishna Devaraya always treated him as a brother, as an elder brother because we drank milk from the same mother, so we are brothers, that's how he considered this. So as… as an expression of his gratitude, he gave away a few villages to this boy and he said, okay, you make your own kingdom. This village bumpkin got these few things and within a few years he squandered everything and lost everything and again back to square one. Krishna Devaraya went on to become a great emperor. Then one day, this man who was over thirty years of age at that time thought, my younger brother has become a great emperor and I am with nothing. Let me go there and see if I could get something out of this. And he went. 
Krishna Devaraya welcomed him as a, as you would welcome a elder brother. He just looked at this. Krishna Devaraya had gathered a scintillating array of talent in his court. He looked at all this, all kinds of debates going on, concerts going on on a daily basis. He was just amazed. And above all, this Tenali Rama, such a brilliant assistant. Then he lamented with Krishna Devaraya, you are so successful, you have become a great emperor because you have such intelligent people around you. If only I had people like you around me, I would also become a great emperor. Particularly this Tenali Rama, if I had someone like him with me, I would also become a great emperor. So Krishna Devaraya felt bad about this and uh, he asked, what shall I do, my brother? He said, if you can give this Tenali Rama to me, I will go and build a great empire of my own. So immediately Krishna Devaraya called Tenali Rama and ordered, you must go with my elder brother, he wants you. So Tenali Rama said, oh, your elder brother wants me, why? I can send my elder brother with him. Asking, he doesn't know what to do. Oh, you really have an elder brother? I did not know. No, I have an elder brother. Let us send my elder brother with your elder brother. That looked like a good idea for Krishna Devaraya because he is not eager to lose Tenali Rama, but at the same time his elder brother is asking. So they went and asked this man. So Tenali Rama's elder brother is willing to come with you, is that okay? So this fool thought, if Tenali Rama is so intelligent, his elder brother… <laughs> he said, fine. Next day he is to leave and a huge send-off has been organized. So in the full assembly of the court, everybody has assembled and Tenali Rama came with a bull on the rope. He walked into the court. Krishna Devaraya saw this and asked, what is this? Why have you brought this bull into the court? No, my lord, this is my elder brother. He said, what nonsense, what is this you're trying to do? No, we drank milk from the same mother. <laughs> so this repetitive intelligence is what we are referring to as karma. Once you get identified with something that you are not, your intelligence is no good. It just becomes repetitive. When we see somebody going through certain patterns, irrespective of the situations in which they exist, sun came up wonderfully today morning, but somebody is miserable. Hmm? He is not able to enjoy the sunrise. He is not able to enjoy the beautiful breeze. He is not able to enjoy the fragrance of the flowers. His karma is going on. Flowers are blossoming, weather is good, everything is great, but somebody is miserable. Then we say, oh, this is his karma. Why we are saying this is, this is his own doing because he has set up patterns which are just repetitive. Karma means action, your action. Or in other words, your experience of life is one hundred percent your doing, nobody else is doing. So every parent has this concern, every generation has this concern that the next generation is going wrong, always. I understand what you're saying. This sudden change, if every generation likes to go one step beyond where the previous generation has stepped in, on ev almost everything, just for the sake of doing something different, or it's natural, they have grown up in one atmosphere, they take it they to another to level. They the next level. Yes. Uh, next is not always next, <laughs> that's what you're saying. Next is not always next, right? It is next. It's n so, this concern is always there, but Right now, the change that is happening is not the next. It is a serious influence because in the last fifteen years, the world's ability to communicate across cultures and borders is so heavy and so unprecedented. Nobody has ever been used to this kind of influences before, okay, never before. This level of influence on our young people, never before possible, no other generation has ever experienced this kind of onslaught from so many directions and the volume of influence is too big. 
So, uh, in terms of changes are happening, not it is not next, it is simply somewhere and nobody knows where it is because it's too complex and too mixed. Nobody knows where it is including the young people, it's just a mix of things. So this is because of a sudden onslaught of information and communication. It is not for us to judge whether it's good or bad, it is just that, definitely this level of information. When I say information, it's like when we were growing up, I believe it was true for your generation also, we never knew what is boredom, okay? There was no such thing, we were just excited about everything that came our way. But you see today twelve-year-old kids, if you tell them what, oh, <laughs> yes. you see, they're yes. just bored because they know the whole cosmos, they've, it's, they've seen it on their phone screen, not even on a computer screen. <laughs> on the phone screen they've seen entire cosmos, they know everything. Things that you do not know, they know, you ask them, they know it. Yes. By information, by the time they're eighteen, they have had five love affairs and gone. In the western world it's like that, here also it's beginning to happen. Okay? <laughs> so by the time they're eighteen, they've seen everything that you need to see with body, mind, emotion, okay? By the time they're twenty-five, what? What next? What next? No. Yes. You will see, this is not my wish, but this is something that I see. The way people's minds are working, the way they're being laden with information. Uh, I'm not a, by any standards a pessimistic person, but I'm just seeing this. If this level of information continues and it'll multiply manifold for the coming generations, you should not be surprised in the next fifty to hundred years, if fifty percent of the human population choose to commit suicide, you should not be surprised because that is what will happen to the mind. Somebody is clapping, look at this, it's popular <laughs> This has happened. Uh, if you look at European philosophy in the last hundred, hundred and fifty years, you will see, if you read Dostoevsky, you will want to commit suicide. Brilliant, intellectually brilliant, but you will wonder why are you alive? Because intellect is like that. If you wake up in the morning, devoid of any… touching any life's experience within you, don't think about your child's face, do not think about the flowers in the garden, birds in the sky, nothing beautiful that ever touched you. Just think logically, you have to get out of bed, that's not a small feat. You have to brush your teeth, breakfast, go to work, eat, work, eat, sleep, again tomorrow morning same thing. Next fifty years you have to do the same process every day. If you look at it one hundred percent logically and intellectually, you will have no reason to live today morning, tomorrow morning. It's only if you're touched by something, suddenly it's worth living. If you're not touched by anything, then it's not worth living. Today, this day, more people commit suicide in this world than all the wars and murders and accidents manage to kill. So more people are on self-help already than murderers, warmongers, bad drivers, everything put together. More people are on self-help. And if this level of information onslaught continues on human mind, I know the nature of mind absolutely because I know my mind. I know how it works, what it can handle, what it cannot do. I know it clearly what human mind is. That's the reason why I don't have to uh, read people's books or listen to their entire thing. If they say one sentence, I know what their mind is. Because I know the structure of human mind entirely, otherwise I won't be who I am. So I'm saying this, if this level of information onslaught continues at the same pace or at higher pace, which is possible in the next few years, this will definitely lead to wanting to terminate yourself because there will be nothing to live for. There is no joy and excitement about anything. You please watch your children, by the time they're twelve, fifteen, they're just bored. You look back at your own life, those of you who are over fifty years of age, just look back at your own life. When you were twelve, fifteen, was there any room for you to get bored about anything? Simply you were excited about every little thing, isn't it? Because we are talking about love and life, all this will not mean nothing. 
because you had one love affair when you were eighteen years of age, you thought this is your life and you're going to willing to die for it, whether you died for it or not, but at least at that time you thought you'll die for it, okay? <laughs> Today by the… on Facebook they had twenty-two love affairs going simultaneously <laughs> It just means nothing. I'm not saying they should have it or not have it, all I'm saying is, this will lead to a certain overload on the mind and suddenly a human being will think, why am I here? You know that big Shakespearean question, to be or not to be, yes. is not the most intelligent question. Unfortunately, people think so. This is only because you have not been touched by life. You are not a piece of life, you are just a psychological case. You are full of thoughts and emotions, you have not touched life at all. You think your thoughts and emotions are life? No. Your thoughts and emotions are the drama that you're creating in your mind, it is your cinema. You must be able to end it somewhere. If you do not know how to put the end, then it's going on endless cinema, you're going crazy. Life is happening here. You know, your work is not life, your family is not life, your career is not life, your cinema is not life, your thought is not life, your emotion is not life. Life is happening here, everything else is accessories to life. Now, the frills of life have become larger than life itself. Life is entirely missed. If you touch life within you, then it's an explosion of energy. When such a thing never happens to you because you have information about the whole cosmos on your phone screen, you'll never be touched by life because too much information, too much thought, even emotion is drying up, too much thought. What is… what is so worth living about a human being? Waking up in the morning, trudging through life every day, eating, sleeping, same rubbish, what is the point? There is no point. Unless you're touched by something, some magic of life if it doesn't touch you, either in the form of love or in the form of a flower or in the form of something within you. If something doesn't sparkle within you, definitely there is a question whether I should live or not, isn't it? and we are taking humanity in that direction with this overload of information. Information is not knowing, information is just garbage collection. You just gather things which don't mean anything to you. You look smart in a tea party, <laughs> but you're not smart with life, okay? If you're smart with life, you must be blissful, isn't it? <laughs> if you're really smart with life, you must be joyful and blissful, isn't it so? You're only smart in a tea party. Because, you know, when somebody is talking something, you know the galaxy Z22, what happens there? Everybody, wow! They can also open the internet and the same thing, you, you think this guy visited the galaxy? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Uh, I happened to listen to a lecture of yours that uh, talked about joy and happiness. You talked that joy depends on oneself whereas happiness depends on others. Uh, I tried a little while to practice it, but what I found was that I was not able to sustain those small moments of joy. I could experience joy when I was completely into it, very passionate about what to do, but somehow when an external uh, person or say some external entity recognizes what I do, the joy is just out of my life. So how do you sustain those moments of joy and not succumb to these pleasures of happiness? If you could, it would be nice if you can share the difference between joy and happiness to this crowd too. <laughs> See, right now, if I tell you, or if you're not me, let's say your dean tells you from tomorrow all of you what kind of clothes you should wear, immediately there'll be protests in the college. If your dean goes further and says everybody must eat only four idlis in the morning, if your dean tells you everybody should get up at five o'clock in the morning, let's say he put ten different rules like this, physical things to do. You will think he is trying to convert you into slaves and you will shout and scream for your freedom, isn't it? But look at yourself and see, right now somebody else, if they determine what should happen around you, you feel like a slave. But right now somebody else is determining what should happen within you. Is this not slavery? Somebody can decide whether you're happy or unhappy. Is this not slavery? Somebody can decide whether you will be a pleasant human being or an unpleasant human being. Is this not slavery? 
what happens within you, somebody else determines. This is the worst form of slavery, isn't it? This human being, life around you will not happen, will never happen hundred percent the way you want it. And it should not happen, because if everything happens the way you want it, where do I go? Possible in the sense, whenever things don't work, there is a habit in lots of people, they will look up, uparwala. Isn't it? The whole world is looking up. And uh, now that you're a student, you're still a student, I believe about sixty, seventy percent is happening your way. When you get married, the percentage will get reversed <laughs> We don't know <clears throat> well, we don't know whether which way it will go. So if life around you will never happen hundred percent the way you want it and it should not. Unless you're living with machines, life will not happen and even those machines will freak on you, isn't it? So, outside will never happen hundred percent the way you want it and if your happiness or your joyfulness or let's not use all these so many words, essentially it is pleasantness versus unpleasantness. For pleasantness, we have many names, we call it peace, happiness, joy, bliss, ecstasy. For unpleasantness, we have many names, stress, anxiety, fear, tension, whatever else, madness, whatever. Pleasantness versus unpleasantness. If your pleasantness is dependent upon what happens around you, the chances of you being pleasant all the time is remote, isn't it? In the very nature of things, it's not possible. There is only one thing you can be certain of right now, this is you know what is outward, what is inward. This one thing you're sure, isn't it? This is inward, this is outward. This is the only privilege you have. What is outward, what is inward, this is all you know. Just in case someday if you get enlightened, you will lose that also <laughs> Yes, that's what happened to me. Now I don't know which is inward, which is outward, which is me, which is not me, that's why I'm all over the world. Because I don't know whether this is me or that is me. Can you see me? Just point out where I am. Use your hands and point out. Can you see me? Oh, you got it wrong. You know I'm a mystic. You're getting it completely wrong. Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in your retina, you know the whole story, right? Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Everything that ever happened to you, darkness and light happened within you, pain and pleasure happened within you, joy and misery happened within you, have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? No. So what I am asking you is, what happens within you, who should determine how it should happen? Hmm? What happens within you, who should determine how this should happen? Somebody else? Definitely you should determine what should happen within this, isn't it? So if you determine what's happening within this, your whole experience of life will be determined by you, nobody else but you, isn't it? The events around you may not be determined by you, but how your experience of life is on this planet is one hundred percent determined by you if you take charge of this. If you leave it loose, just about anybody will determine it. They will, not consciously, they also like you by accident. What are the best practices for someone who is dead serious? Dead or serious? Well, it once happened. There was a Sufi master in Basra. No Basra? Basra is uh, that place which is famous for pearls today in Iraq or 
it's famous for bombing, whichever way. So, someone came and said, uh, please give me a teaching. He refused, no teaching. Then more and more important people started coming to him and said, please give us a teaching. He said, no teaching. Now, because he refuses to teach, he became very famous. So one day, a great scholar in the area who is well versed in all the scriptures and everything, he came and insisted, you have to teach. You have something that no scholar can have, so you have to teach, you cannot keep it to yourself. So, the Sufi master looked at him and said, I am not giving a teaching to you, not because I am not willing, because you are not willing. The scholar said, what are you saying, I am not willing, I am here, I am asking you. Now the teaching that I give, you will not be willing. He said, what is the teaching? Are you willing? Anything I am willing. So, the master went inside, brought a, a dirty looking piece of cloth and gave it to him and said, wear this as your loincloth, you take off all your robes and nice clothes, wear this as your loincloth. The scholar looked at this dirty piece of cloth, said, what this? Not just that. Then, I will give you an empty can with a string, wear it around your neck and I will give you a few sweets, peppermint. You go on the street to the marketplace, all the young boys will look at you and tease you and throw stones at you. Whoever throws a stone at you, take out a peppermint, grin at them and give them a peppermint. The scholar said, this is ridiculous, what will happen to me in this town if I do such a ridiculous thing? See, I told you, you're not willing for the teaching <laughs> because the question is just this, do you want a teaching that you like or do you want something that transforms you? That's a question. So now you're asking this question, I am dead serious, it's very important you do simple things. Very important things you're doing in your life, you will become dead serious. So the first and foremost thing is you must make yourself non-serious, which is not possible. So the only way you can make yourself non-serious is to be ridiculous, you know? Can you do that? Can you get up and do a jig right now? Do it. So, you see you're getting little non-serious now. <laughs> Not dead at least, still serious, not dead. So, just loosen up your life a little bit, laugh a little more, involve yourself with people around you, do things that you think is not so important. Don't do things which are very important, do simple things. Seriousness has come essentially because of your self-importance. You hold yourself as an important person. I want you to see you are like a speck of dust in this existence. Tomorrow morning if you disappear, for sure in India nobody will miss you. Even down under, they won't bother much, you know. A handful of people, they will also forget soon enough. Isn't it so? Oof! You know, Burton Russell, an Englishman, Burton Russell said, if you're beginning to think that what you're doing is very important, you need to take a holiday. So holiday does not mean coming to India. Holiday is every day in those twenty-four hours you must take a holiday from your seriousness. Nature does woof, you're gone. And nothing will happen in this world, everything will happen wonderfully well even if you're not there. Every human being should be aware of this every moment of his life. It does not matter what the whole world says about you. It does not matter 
how significant a work you're doing, you must understand that tomorrow morning the world will go on fine without you, whoever you may be. Isn't it so? If you constantly remind yourself of this, you'll have no reason to be serious. Definitely not dead. And don't be dead now, a time will come. It's time to be alive. <laughs> Faith, God, luck, effort. Maybe all of them, but in what proportion? So when you say fate, obviously it's something that you cannot do anything about. When you say luck, again obviously it's something that you cannot do anything about. When you say God, again it's something that you cannot do anything about. So only thing that's in your hands is effort. So put your hundred percent into your effort, what happens, happens, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so don't leave proportions of your energy and your capability to luck, God, fate, all these things. That's not your business, if there is such a thing, it will act. Your business is only effort, isn't it? Just do that. So that's all you must do in your life. Constantly looking for ways to enhance your perception and your intelligence. Rest will anyway happen. This is one thing that unfortunately humanity is not doing. They're trying to become capable of something. Do not try to become capable of something. Just enhance your perception and intelligence, whatever comes your way. Effort has to be incisive in the sense, it should be focused, calibrated. Simply if you make effort, it's foolish effort, isn't it? Just labor is not going to get you somewhere. Right kind of action, the right timing, right place, all this is important, isn't it? So, for all these things to happen, you need perception and intelligence. Right now, let us say it's like this, you know, this is happening in the world all the time. Everybody wants to become a doctor. Not now, if twenty-five years ago it was so. If you want to study means, first thing is medicine. If you don't get a seat, what's next? Engineering. Don't get a seat, what? Next thing, next thing, like this. Most people are becoming doctors because they think somebody's sickness is a lucrative business. <laughs> it's a very… I don't want to go into other aspects, it's quite disturbing for me <laughs> There are a few doctors who really want to be that. They want to understand the human system and they want to serve in that direction, that's great. Suppose everybody became healthy, you don't want that, isn't it? Yes, you don't want that. So let's say you became a doctor and let us say everybody came to the yoga program and they stopped going to your doctor. At least your visits to the doctor has come down, isn't it? Has it? Has it come down or no? For sure, it's come down. So business will go down. It will no more be a good profession to go into because very few doctors are becoming doctors because they want to become doctors. Others are becoming doctors because they think it's lucrative, isn't it? Isn't it so? So do not try to put up a recipe for your success. Success is only when you are able to use yourself to your full potential. It doesn't matter whether you become a doctor or a politician or a yogi or what the hell you become is not the thing. Success means you are 
living your life to your full potential. That's what success means. If that has to happen, you need perception and an active intelligence. Most intelligent people on this planet are generally the most miserable people on the planet. This is simply because they have an active intelligence but no perception of life. So, one thing, one most important thing that people have not worked at is to enhance their perception. They're trying to broaden their mind, that's not the point. That will only make you socially successful, not truly successful. If you want to be truly successful, you must be able to see everything just the way it is, without distortions. If you can see everything just the way it is, life becomes a play. You can play joyfully, you can play it well for sure. If you can play it well, people will say you're successful. How do I grow my intelligence? Don't worry about that. Right now, the important thing is to enhance your perception. If you're able to see life just the way it is, you have the necessary intelligence to conduct it well. If you're not able to see life the way it is, your intelligence will work against you. You should never think, I want to be successful. Don't ever think, I want to be successful. Just see how to make this being into a full-fledged being. People will say one day, oh, he's successful, he's a great success. You should not be aspiring for success, it's a miserable way to structure your life. You will simply cause pain and suffering to yourself and suffering to everybody because your idea of success is sitting on top of somebody's head, isn't it? Yes or no? This is your idea of success. This is not success, this is sickness. So do not ever think of success, just see how to make this into a full-fledged being. This will find expression. If it finds good expression, people around you will say, oh, he is a great success, that's fine. People should recognize you're a success. You should not be thinking how to be successful, very wrong way to approach life. Sadhguruji, then what is it? Uh, okay, so for all of us, what, how do we live our days? What is the best way to just go about it? Give us in clear, simple, simple sentences, do this and you will be at least on the way to being blissful or happy or aware or living in a nice conscious way. If you, if you just observe, if everybody makes a little effort, everybody take a little time for this piece of life, okay? Not for your family, not for your career, not for something else, something else. Just for this piece of life, give it little time because this is the most important piece of life in your life, isn't it? Just look at the ceiling and smile, you are still awake, you're still there. And for Many, many millions of people, somebody who is dear to them did not wake up. So just check those five, six people around you, they all woke up, wow, it's a fantastic day. <laughs> you woke up and everybody who matters to you around you woke up. Yeah. Is it not fantastic day? Yes. You don't think so. Yes. <laughs> yes. You don't seem to think so. <laughs> yes. Because the problem is just this. You are living with an idea that you are immortal. When I say you are immortal, you are not actually thinking you are immortal, but you are not conscious of your mortality. <laughs> Even if you are in love with somebody, still this is the most important piece of life, isn't it? So pay some attention to this, how does it happen? Why have you taken it for granted? Believe me, you are not going to be here forever. I'll bless you with a long life, but you're going to fall dead one day. Yes or no? Yes. So, do not take this for granted. If you wake up in the morning, tomorrow if you wake up in the morning <laughs> No, this is not my wish, <laughs> but I want you to know of all the people who go to bed tonight, over a million people will not wake up tomorrow morning. 
And tomorrow, if you and me wake up tomorrow morning, is it not a fantastic thing? A million people did not wake up, you woke up. Is it not a great thing? This one thing if you do, if you just remind yourself, you don't think this is a negative thing, death is not a negative thing, it's the only thing which has added value to your life. If you're here forever, you would be unbearable. <laughs> yes, yes. Isn't it? Aren't yes. we glad everybody dies one day? <laughs> if you just become conscious of this one thing, that always you're conscious that I'm mortal. You don't have to think I will die today, we don't intend, we want to live as far as possible. Just you know one day I will die. If you're just conscious of this one thing, you will naturally become spiritual. If you're not conscious of your mortality, somewhere you think you're immortal, isn't it? How many moments in a day are you conscious that you're mortal? If you were conscious, would you have time to crib? Would you have time to fight with somebody? Would you have time to do some rubbish with your life? If you knew, if you are conscious that you are mortal, you would do nothing other than what is absolutely needed for you and everybody around you. Every day, every moment if you remind yourself, this is a brief life, I am mortal, one day I will end. Just do this for two days and see, you will become something truly fantastic within yourself, just this is all. <laughs> that is simply beautiful. That's all that's needed. If you want to know the value of life, just know that it's a brief happening. If you are capable of causing depression to yourself, I am saying this not without any concern for your illness or not due to lack of compassion, because that is the nature of what's happening to you. If you are causing depression to yourself, you are able to generate substantial amount of intense emotions and thoughts, but in the wrong direction. If you don't have very strong emotions, very intense thoughts about something, you cannot get depressed. It is just that you are generating thoughts and emotion which work against you, not for you. So you are strong enough to cause depression to yourself because for you to cause a mental illness for yourself, unless you are pathologically ill, which is just a small number of people, rest are all self-created. Most of them are self-created. A few are pathologically ill, it's… they cannot help it. It just comes from within because of genetic and other factors. You must understand even if you got angry for a moment, you're already ill. Maybe you don't get the certificate of diagnosis. They don't slap a certificate on you that you're gone, but you are going, isn't it? You think it's your right to throw tantrums? You think it's your right to get angry with people? You think it's your privilege to be depressed so that you'll get attention from somebody? You keep playing this, one day you will not able… you will not be able to turn back. Keep crossing the line every day, one day you will see you cannot cross back. That day you need a doctor. Till then, everybody needed a respite from you. But the day you can't cross back, they get the respite because now they can catch you and give you to your doctor. Otherwise, you're temporarily going mad every day, many times a day. They cannot even send you to an asylum. They have to bear with you, your family, your friends, your people around you. If you get at least truly clinically ill, we can hand you over. Almost everybody here, if we train them towards a certain kind of thought process and emotion and push them a little bit with the outside situations, 
almost everybody will go lose their mental balance. They will become clinically ill. They can be driven to madness, I'm saying, because the line between sanity and insanity is very thin. People keep pushing it. You get angry, you're pushing the line. It's a thin line. In fact, when you get angry, you know you're pushing the line. That's why the expression, I was mad at somebody. You're not mad at somebody, you're just going mad. You cannot be mad at somebody. You're just pushing your sanity, the boundaries of sanity and moving into insanity for a certain period of time and coming back. You do one thing, every day you try this, ten minutes a day, try intense anger on somebody. What? You will see in three months' time, you will be clinically there. Yes? Just try it if you want, because if you keep pushing the line, you go mad and you come back, you go mad and you come back, one day you're not able to come back, that's all. One day you're not able to turn back, then you're clinically ill. The last twenty-nine years, I have not been able to cancel one program because I'm running temperature, I got a cold, I got this, I got that. It doesn't matter what's happening, what you have to do, you anyway have to do. You can't turn back on that. Either out of your commitment or you have a boss like that. One or one way or the other, if it happens, then you will see, you will not at all fall sick so often. Because if you have temperature, you still have to go. If it's summer, you still go, right? No, a lot of people don't go. It's a little hot outside, they don't go and work. <laughs> little cold outside, they don't go and work. A little raining, they won't go and work. A snowflake, they will not go and work. This is just weather. So for every change in weather, if you have the comfort of covering yourself in a blanket and lying down, once you create that, your body will learn to fall sick as often as possible. When you are a child, physical illness is good because you'll get attention from your mother and father and everybody around you and you don't have to go to school on that day. <laughs> so you learn the art of falling physically ill. But once you get married, you learn the art of becoming mentally ill. Because if you want to get attention, you go sit in a corner, <laughs> act depressed, people will pay attention to you. So, you pl keep playing this game, one day you're not able to cross the line back, that day you're clinically ill. Unfortunately, In many ways, not just in the way that I said now, in many different ways, I would say seventy percent of illnesses on the planet, all kinds, are self-created. Even if you get an infection, there is a way. If you keep yourself in a certain way physically and mentally, the virus and the bacteria will not work the same way as it works upon somebody else. If you set yourself like this, no matter what's happening. Anyway, I have to go and do this, this and this. There's no break from that. This wraps up the video filled with pearls of wisdom and the best life advice that can help you transform your life. Click on the video shown on the screen to see more from us. What would you like to see in the next video? Share your moments and thoughts in the comments section. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching.